Crossroads. Each week, Chevrolet presents a true story based on the actual experiences of American clergymen, pastor, priest, or rabbi. The men who take part in the everyday drama of people at the crossroads of life. These exciting true stories have been selected by our board of advisors. Captain Maurice M. Witherspoon. Father George B. Ford. And Dr. William F. Rosenblum. And now, for our story. This is an out-of-the-way community of a size wherein everyone is family, friend, or neighbor. A lovely town, warmed by the southern sun and scented by the blue grass. I'll see you later, fellas. Take it. Perhaps you should watch where you're going. Excuse me, ma'am. But uh, who do you think you're pushing? Maybe you could use a few lessons in good manners. Oh, you could use a few lessons too, mister. Nobody pushes Bill Decker around. No time, no place, and for no reason. Now you stand right over here, lady, and close your eyes. Maybe a few lessons in boxing, too. That was a trick. You ducked. You didn't. May I open my eyes now? Uh, maybe I could use a few lessons at that from you. No hard feelings. None at all. I hope you're going to be in town long enough to give me at least a couple of boxing lessons. Maybe in town quite a while. You can always find me at the Presbyterian Church. I'm the new minister. If I were to say that I have been shocked with conditions as I have found them since coming here, I would be putting it mildly. Law enforcement is practically non-existent. Badly behaved citizens mirror the weaknesses and shortcomings of their governing bodies. If I have seemed to make this the subject of a sermon, it's because I believe that the preaching of good government to be of equal importance to the preaching of the gospel, good government and godliness go hand in hand. That sermon of yours made some of us do a lot of deep thinking. Every word you said about what goes on here in Southern City was the gospel truth. So, some of us got together, talked it over, and we decided that something ought to be done about it. We also decided that you're the one to do it. Well, I'm glad that my sermon had some effect, but what can I do? I, uh, I suppose you heard that old Judge Tolliver had resigned this morning? Yes, I did. We want you to take his place. Well, gentlemen, I have no qualifications that would fit me for the bench. Well, we figure that you're a man who practices what he preaches. Now, here's your chance to do something about the things you were preaching about. But, gentlemen, even if I did accept, how could I assume such a position? No trouble about that. The town council will petition the governor and he'll appoint you to the job. I will accept on two conditions, gentlemen. First, the synod of the Presbyterian Church approves. And second, the town council will grant me complete authority on the bench. Don't you worry about that. Once you're on that bench, you'll be the judge. The whole town's up in arms. A common barroom bully. A street fighter. A leopard can't change his spots. We'll have a riot on our hands. McClure won't get away with it. Hi. Hi, Cole. Come on, sweetheart. You and old Cole Brennan are going to dance. Oh, I don't want to dance with you. What's the matter? Afraid your boyfriend won't like it? I can handle it. Yeah. Brennan, you're drunk. The fun's fun, but you're annoying the ladies. You want to make something of it? Yeah. Now, wait, wait, wait. Take it easy. Sit down. You won't make any trouble, do you, Cole? Take your lousy hands off me. Come on, come on. Come on. Let me get you a drink. I... Come on, baby. Cole Brennan wants to dance. He wants to dance. Police Department, Marshal Decker speaking. Rosebud in, right away. Hey, hold it, hold it. I was hoping you'd 
show up. <laughs> Good evening. Come in, gentlemen. Well, what excuse are you going to make for your marshal this time? Excuse? Is there any question that Brennan was not drunk and disorderly? You can't go lowering the boom on every young man that wants to let off a little steam. What you're trying to tell me is that I can't lower the boom if it's Cole Brennan, isn't that it? Oh, well, I'll admit that Cole may be a little wild and hard to handle at times, but that's just his way. From his conduct, I would say he has a vicious, arrogant, mean streak and is potentially a dangerous man. And because he has never been punished for any of his misdeeds, it hasn't helped straighten him out. It seems to me you're beginning to run that court with a very high hand. It seems to me that you gentlemen are forgetting that you're the ones that convinced me that a minister could be a judge for the good of Southern City. So for the good of Southern City, I'm afraid that you're stuck with me. It is in court, Your Honor, and ready. Then we can proceed. Will Marshal William Decker take the stand, please? Oh, well, just a minute, if the court please. Well, we object to the introduction of any testimony by Mr. Decker. Why? He, he's the arresting officer. On what grounds? On the grounds that uh, in his rather dubious past, uh, before his prominence as town marshal, William Decker was convicted in this very court of perjury. I have a record of the conviction here. I submit it for the court's consideration. It seems that I have no alternative but to dismiss the witness. <laughs> Are there other complaining witnesses? There are many people here who witnessed this whole affair whose testimony could prove the truth of the charges against the defendant. And the court would like to ask a few questions of Mr. Brennan, under oath. Have him sworn. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth? Oh, sure. And nothing but the truth, so help you God. Your name? Cole Brand. Be seated, please. Were you drunk as charged? No, Your Honor. I was sober as a judge. <laughs> Did you resist arrest and assault Marshal Decker with a deadly weapon? Certainly not. I'm a law-abiding citizen. That's all. You can step down. In view of the lack of any evidence, I have no alternative except to dismiss the case. Thank you, Your Honor. As a judge, and also as a minister, I am ashamed of the behavior of the people of this community, especially the people who witnessed this whole affair, and who, for some reason, refused to lend their help to the cause of justice and smirk at an attack on their own officer of the law. I'm sure you will all regret your part in this travesty. Case dismissed. Was I drunk? That <laughs> gospel shark asked me, was I drunk? Is that a laugh? <laughs> what do you expect me to do? Get down on my knees before him, ask him to forgive me my sins, talk myself into the hoose oh, Cole, take it a little bit easy, will you? Don't talk so loud about what happened in court today. Why not? Everybody knows what a chump I made out of McClure anyway. Did you assault Marshal Decker with a deadly weapon, he asked me. 
I only wish I'd had a chance to use that broken bottle on his ugly mug. I had fixed his looks for keeps. Cole, people can hear you. So what? The Reverend Judge McClure had to dismiss the charges, didn't he? Let's have another drink. This is celebration. I don't have to tell you, Mr. McClure. If I thought there was any chance of me being able to stay on the job and to do you any good, I'd never think of leaving. But I want you to stay on the job, Bill. Wait a minute. Mr. McClure? Yes, won't you come in? My name is Jim Roberts. I'm a reporter with a Southern Recorder. Oh, this is uh, Mrs. McClure. How do you do? How do you do, Mrs. McClure? And our town marshal, William Decker. Ex-town marshal, Mr. Roberts. I saw Mr. Decker in court today. What can I do for you, Mr. Roberts? Well, my paper has sent me to Southern City on a special assignment. I've been here for three days now, just nosing around. I didn't know that Southern City was so newsworthy. Your husband is, Mrs. McClure. He's going to be great copy. A real human interest story. A minister sitting as a judge. And doing a whale of a job at them both. Well, I hardly know what to say. I've never been interviewed before, especially by a big-town newspaper man. Well, this isn't exactly an interview, Mr. McClure. I may be sticking my neck out a mile, but I hate to see anyone thumb his nose at a court the way Cole Brennan did today. Especially when I know that he was guilty. Well, uh, Mr. Decker and I knew that he was guilty, too, but without evidence, we couldn't prove it. But you can prove it now, out of Brennan's own mouth. I've just been listening to him for the past three hours, bragging about how he got away with it. Even so, Mr. Roberts, it's too late. Yes, the law of double jeopardy, he can't be tried twice for the same offense. He can be tried for committing perjury, can't he? Subpoena me, and I'll testify that Cole Brennan stated in my presence and the presence of others that he lied under oath. Or perhaps you're about willing to admit that Cole Brennan and some of the right people in this town are above the law. Bill, will you go bring Brennan in? Yes, sir. Open the door and the lice come in. I got a warrant for you, Cole. Warrant? For what? For perjury in court. And this time there's a witness you won't be able to hush up. You just try to take me. I don't want any trouble with you, Cole. Why don't you make it easy on yourself just for once? Now, come on. Look. came in here without his uniform, with a gun. I thought he was coming to get me to get even for what happened in court today, and I I had to shoot him in self-defense. Oh, no, I'll help you all I can, Cole, but I can't make up a lie like that. You go back on me now, and I'll ruin you. I'll squeeze every dollar you got till its throat rattles. You know I can do it, too. I almost feel as if I were Bill's murderer. After all, it was I who sent him to his death. Don't forget that it was I who gave you the tip that cost him his life. One thing, my paper is going to cover this story to the limit. I'll get it. Mr. Conner. It seems to me that you're making an awfully big thing out of a local affair, Mr. Roberts, and the people of Southern City don't like it too much. Murder is not a local affair, Mr. Connors, and no one should like it. I'm a friend of Cole Brennan's and he's in trouble. I'm just asking you to give the boy a break. Did the boy give Bill Decker a break? A man who gave his life in the performance of his duty? But he swears it was self-defense. The Decker wasn't wearing his uniform. He busted in on him with his pistol drawn. I don't believe it. And I've learned what value to place on sworn testimony by Cole Brennan when he appeared before me in court. He perjured himself then. I'm sure he's lying now. You may have reason to regret this. 
I'm a vestryman, don't forget. No, Mr. Connors, it's you who may have reason to regret. Regret not having courage to stand for what's right. I know he was a fine, loyal gentleman after I appointed him. I never knew him to harbor a grudge or commit a mean or ignoble act. I'm proud to say that he was my friend, and I find it in my heart to wish that I and this town of Southern City could have more friends with the quality and courage of William Decker. If he was guilty of anything, it was in doing his duty without fear or favor. And it cost him his life. To those of you who remember him as Bill Decker of the Taverns, and not as William Decker, your town marshal, may I say unto you, let him who is without sin among you cast the first stone. Have you anything more to add, Mr. McClure? No, Mr. Coroner, not at the moment. Thank you. You may step down. Call Daniel Connors to the stand. Will Daniel Connors take the stand? Looks like Mrs. Connors is worried about something. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give in this inquiry to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Your name? Daniel Connors. Be seated, please. Now, Mr. Connors, you were with uh, Mr. Brennan just before the, uh, the shooting, were you not? Well, I walked over to his office with him, if that's what you mean. What time was that? Well, I, I don't know exactly. Understand, isn't it, Mrs. Connors? What do you mean? Well, I know without a question of a doubt that last night Brennan with Sergeant James and your husband was at the tavern, and Brennan got pretty drunk and rather boastful, and your husband left with him to take him home. That can be testified to by Roberts, the reporter. But Cole Brennan didn't go home. That's right. Now, what time did your husband get home, Mrs. Connors? I don't know exactly. But it was after the shooting. I don't know. I hope Mr. Connors doesn't get further implicated in this. If it develops that he is an accessory... He isn't. He told me exactly how it happened. Well, if he told you how it happened, then he must have been there when it happened. Oh, please, Mr. McClure. I've been beside myself with worry. I didn't mean to tell. Mrs. Connors, as your pastor, I think it's your duty to tell, because if you remain silent, even to shield your own husband, you're condoning murder. You're making yourself a party to it, just as sure as if you had pulled the trigger on the gun that killed Bill Decker. I begged my husband to tell the truth, that Cole Brennan wouldn't listen to him that he wouldn't go home, that he insisted on going to the office. Suppose you tell me the truth. See if I can convince your husband. I can't. I can't bear witness against Dan. And it's killing me. been drawn through the ringer. I'm glad to get it over with. Did you testify that you were in Brennan's office when he killed uh, Bill Decker? Well, you're crazy. No, you're insane if you think you can perjure yourself on the witness stand. You were at Brennan's office and not at his home. That can be proven. Well, I suppose I was. 
and you were there when he killed Bill Decker. Just try to prove that. Don't worry, it'll come out. Well, you don't understand. Every cent I have in the world is tied up in my business with Cole Brennan. He holds my notes, he can ruin me. Not as much as you're ruining yourself now. I haven't been able to sleep. I can't get it off my mind. I can't even talk about it to anyone. To no one but your wife. Don't you see? You're going to have to spend the rest of your lives in the hell of your own doing. Nothing can save you but the truth. I can't. I have to live with the people in this town. First, you have to live with yourself. Come on. We're going back in there. Mr. Cole Brennan to the stand. Mr. Coroner, please. I would like for the moment to assume the role of Amicus Correa, friend of the court, in the interest of justice. After all, this is Judge McClure's own court, and we are here in the interest of justice. Come on up, sit on the bench. Thank you. Your bench. I suggest that the coroner recall Mr. Connors to the witness stand to add to his testimony. Uh, objection. Got a good reason why I can't recall any witness? Well, I, uh, I, I want to know what he's going to testify. So do I. So if you'll just keep quiet, we'll both find out. Oh. Mr. Connors, take the stand. When Mr. Connors took the stand before, his testimony was based on his natural concern that he must live with the people in this town. He must also live with one that he loves very dearly. Mr. Connors is a Christian man. He's a member of my church. I believe he's had time to reflect that he forgot something far more important. He has also to live with his God. Mr. Connors, you were present in the office of Cole Brennan at the exact moment when Brennan shot and killed William Decker. Were you not? Yes. May God forgive me, I was. All right, Mr. Connors, tell us in your own words the truth. close this memorial service for William Decker. Let us never forget that in giving his life, he provided the inspiration and incentive which has made this community a better place in which to live. And knowing him, I'm sure that as he looks down upon us now, he has no regrets. <laughs>